Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is for the final quarter, that is the last three months of 2013, and it's entitled The Sanctuary. And this particular lesson is lesson number five in that series for November 2. It's entitled Atonement Purification Offering. And it's a focus on the daily off sin offerings that were offered in the ancient uh, tabernacle at first there in the wilderness, and then later uh, in the temples in Jerusalem. It has some challenging information in it, and we hope that uh, you will listen and have your Bibles ready. Um, because there's a number of verses we're going to look at, and they're not all right at one spot. So um, at the same time, uh, if you would be interested in getting the materials that we look at and we prepare for these studies, uh, those are available online at our, our website. That's theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you would be able to follow right along with us as we struggle with uh, some of these ideas. But before we begin, we hope you got your Bible handy now. Let's have a word of prayer together. Our wonderful Father, we accept the challenge of trying to understand these ideas that were taken from or, or suited to a culture so long ago and so distant from ours. We try to imagine in our own minds what it was like there at the foot of Mount Sinai, building that tent, tabernacle, sanctuary, and step by step, months of working at it. And I'm sure the kids were watching, everybody was watching as the beautiful st structure gradually took, took shape. Now help us to try to understand some of the things that happened there and why you gave that information to them. And most important of all, what that might tell us about what you're doing now in the heavenly sanctuary. Guide us through these words in this discussion is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Purification offering. What's a purification offering? Well, if you look at the context, you'll find out that it's the same as a sin offering. But we don't always want to call it a sin offering because it was, it was sometimes used for women uh, after giving birth. And we don't usually regard that as a sinful experience, and although uh, I guess it's a painful experience. Um, having accompanied a lot of women, I've never been through it myself. but. Uh, so we're going to call it a purification offering here. And uh, may, we need to remind you that part of the reason we're studying this series on the sanctuary is because the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes that just as there were major events through the calendar year, the ancient Jewish calendar year, and you celebrate it at certain times, Passover and Pentecost and, and, and uh, Day of Atonement and so forth, as those different uh, events took place, there are corresponding events which have happened in history. So it's like this calendar year sequence also is a, a, a map, if you will, for the events of the ancient Jewish temple and then the death of Christ and what happened there and then uh, the final events which happened starting the, the beginning of the end of time up beginning in 1844. Does it not say in the Bible, O oh Lord, your way is in the sanctuary? It does, in Psalm. And that's the Psalms? Yes. I believe that's Psalm 73, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, we believe that, and, and, and Moses was told very specifically that he was to build this tabernacle, this tent, after the pattern he was shown in heaven. So, one of the reasons for studying what's going on here is to understand better what's actually going on in heaven. And to get a start, let's go to the New Testament, actually, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For you know what was paid to set you free from the worthless manner of life handed down by your ancestors. Now, I don't know how you would feel if someone said the worthless manner of life that was handed down to you by your ancestors, but that's what Peter said. Does that and mean godless? Probably. It was not something that can be destroyed, such as silver or gold. It was the costly sacrifice of Christ, who was like a lamb without defect or flaw. So you can see why we're using this verse. The 
the costly life of Christ is this perfect lamb that presumably is the, the offering that's being presented in the heavenly sanctuary. Um, now, just to support what I said a moment ago about the purification offering, look at Leviticus 12. Um, and we're, we're just going to read the first few verses of that chapter. Um, the Lord gave Moses the following regulations for the people who are for seven days after a woman gives birth to a son, she is ritually unclean as she is during her monthly period, and so forth. And if you drop down, you'll find out down here it says, uh, after a bunch of stuff, discussion, all about that, it says, um, when the time of purification is completed, verse 6, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring the priest at the entrance of the temple of the Lord's presence, a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. The priest shall present her offering to the Lord and perform the ritual to take away her impurity, and she will be ritually clean. Thus, this then is what a woman must do after giving birth. And that's exactly the same procedure as you would use for purification from sin, presumably. Um, how do you feel about the idea of this being a purification as opposed to a sin offering? Is there, are we comfortable with that? And ladies, you feel like you needed a purification offering after no. giving birth? It may be like um, the first, the new year you make resolutions and stuff. It just gives the person a fresh start to say, okay, now we start from this day forth. I'm all clean. I'm all ready to go. Okay, let's go. So it might be to make a transition mm -hmm. and to make a person feel good that they now have a clean start. I like having a clean start every year. Yeah. I wouldn't. Um, Fair enough. Well, weren't there, weren't there, other things um, uh, that you had to come to the to the to the priest and and be cleansed and so on and so forth? That, like for example, if you I don't know if you touch something dead or yeah. if you touch something with blood, or weren't there some of those kinds yes. of, of of things? So wouldn't that couldn't that cause possibly f this situation fall into that kind of a category? Well, they kept them separate for whatever reason. Yeah, to mm -hmm. me it, it sounds like um, the woman has done something wrong yeah. because it's being used in the same context as a sin offering. Yeah. <laughs> well, today, don't we have the Lord's Supper? I was told that when we go to the Lord's Supper, it's like a mini baptism. It's to renew mm -hmm. our, um, uh, get rid of our sins again, give us a fresh start. So today we have the Lord's Supper, and in those days they, have, uh, they had their uh, ritual, but they couldn't have the Lord's Supper because Jesus hadn't come yeah. and died yet. Mm -hmm. So it's probably about the same thing. Yeah. I see differently. As a woman, I find it kind of, but there's a lot of things in the Bible, everything is the woman's fault. Having a mm -hmm. child it's not, you didn't do anything wrong, and you didn't do it by yourself. How come it's always the woman? Something mm -hmm. is wrong with the woman. Right. And those 30-some days or what have you, during those times, the man can go to another woman because it's the, something is wrong with the woman. So, no. You know, I think we in, in Orthodox, Orthodox Jews today still do that. I think we've missed the point here, though. We're forgetting that there were tens of thousands of people walking in the dust. Mm -hmm. There were no hot and cold showers. There was no running water. Well, there uh, was some, some of it was, <laughs> but some of this was health laws, which yeah. by our standards seem a little bizarre, but you had to be careful in a group like that. But, but how would, how would uh, we're talking about kinds of uh, contaminated things here, yeah. for example. How is going to the priest well, uh, have anything to do with, with uh, 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 somehow uh, cleansing some physical, yes. you know, like you got your feet too dirty <laughs> or something, and yeah. how is going to the priest saying, fixing that exactly. problem? Exactly, and that's the question. Now, here's the real issue in this whole thing. I, and, and the lesson talks about this, but it doesn't give a, a reference. I would like to give a reference. It's found in Isaiah 59, verse 2. It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you, talking about God, it is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship Him. Okay, if that's what happens when you sin, it separates you from God, then theoretically this whole process should deal with that separation, right? 
if it's supposed to, you know, and this is supposed to be a kind of worship. Now, you know, I will have to be honest. If I had been doing this, as I understand it now, and obviously I'm not God, so I'm glad that he did it the way he did it. <laughs> but if I had been doing this, I would have said, why don't you make a school system or something like that instead of a sanctuary? I mean, it looked like everybody needed to be educated. Now, there were times when Moses spoke to the whole crowd, and I suppose those were the educational systems. And the parents were told they were supposed to educate their children when they lay down and when they rose up and when they walked by the way and so forth. So I suppose that was some kind of education. But it seemed to me like what, needed, what was needed was education. Now, maybe that's my misunderstanding. I think you haven't worked 30-some years in the educational system to see how <laughs> okay. Satan can um, corrupt the different parts of the educational system. Mm -hmm. God had it in a sanctuary. He had a structure and an organization, mm -hmm. so Satan couldn't uh, pick it apart piece by piece. But when you have an educational system, uh, it's very difficult to mm -hmm. keep the whole thing operating together and on track and um, teaching what you're supposed to, yeah. my opinion. Well, you need a little more depth in worship, don't you? I mean, when you say you go somewhere to worship God, what do you do? Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody just says worship God. It's just a buzzword. Mm -hmm. um, there's got to be something more depth in worship than just the word worship. Okay, so well, and, and here's the question. The, this particular service, and like I'm saying, we're, we're going to talk about more things as we further get further along in our, in our series of lessons. But this particular lesson focuses on how you deal with past sins. Is that the main thing we need to do as Christians in the 21st century? No. Or is there some other things? Now, it starts off by saying there are three basic kinds of sin. So let's look at those. This is straight out of our Bible study guide. And for those of you who have one in front of you and you want to look at it, uh, this is the section for Sunday. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is God dealing with sin because he needs to deal with sin? Or is God dealing with sin with us because we need to have our sins dealt with so that we can feel like we can talk to God? Didn't Ellen White say that some of the angels and stuff were told they went too far and they could not come back to God, and they were scared to come back to God, where if God puts you through a process, and you say, okay, I've got a fresh start, you're never afraid to come back to God. Mm -hmm. So maybe God is more helping us deal with sin than actually Him dealing with sin. That's possible. Well, let's look at these. There are basically three kinds of sin depicted in the Old Testament. Now, they don't get references for each of these kinds, so each corresponding to the sinner's level of awareness while he or she committed the transgression. So the seriousness of your sin depends on how much you understood at the time you committed the sin. One, inadvertent or unintentional sin. Two, deliberate or intentional sin. And three, rebellious sin. The purification offering prescribed in Leviticus 4.1 through 5.13 applied to the cases of unintentional sin as well as some cases of deliberate sin, and that's the example is found in Leviticus 5.1. Let's just look at that as a, what kind of an intentional sin this is. Sin offerings are required in the following cases. If someone is officially summoned to give evidence in court and does not give information about something he has seen or heard, he must suffer the consequences. Now, is that... Um, it says the sin offering is required in that case and that sounds like it's pretty intentional, doesn't it? It's a sin of omission, though. A yeah. sin of not doing something rather than the sin of doing something. Yeah. While an offering was available for these first two categories, none is mentioned for a rebellious sin, the most heinous kind. Rebellious sin was done in the face of God with a high hand, and the rebel deserved nothing less than to be cut off. And that's found in Numbers 15. And I would encourage you to go over there um, and look at that. Um, but suppose someone unintentionally fails to keep some of these regulations and it goes down through here for ways. But then if you come to um, verses 27, I'm sorry, verse 30, but if any person who sins deliberately, whether he's a native or a foreigner, is guilty of treating the Lord with contempt, and he shall be put to death because he has rejected what the Lord said and has deliberately broken one of his commands, 
he is responsible for his own death. And immediately it tells the story of the man who gathered sticks to build a fire on the Sabbath, and he was stoned to death. Now, did you say that you did not have references in the Bible, or the lesson didn't have references in the Bible? Unintentional sin is referenced. Yeah. Intentional sin is referenced. But rebellion, rebellion sin, sin is nowhere in the Bible that, well, that you could find or that was the, in the lesson? Well, well my question is, of those three, which one is worthy of death? Is it one of them one. or all the of them? One. The last well, one. Well, then what's, what's the point of the other two? Well, you did something you weren't supposed to do. What's that? A mistake. Oh, yeah, a mistake. At okay, least, but, mistake. but um, isn't that just possible if you're ignorant about something? Well, yeah, Isn't that possible. Are, aren't we supposed to be learning about God for eternity? Doesn't that mean that we'll be at some level of ignorance for well, here's, eternity? Here's, here's a problem. <laughs> because if you go to Second Chronicles 10, thir through, 10 through 13, I'm not, well, let's just look at that. that. Maybe we better look at it. Do you remember the story of Manasseh? Manasseh was the son of Hezekiah. Remember, Hezekiah was supposed to die and he pled with God not to let him die, and he was told to put a poultice on the place where he had an abscess or something like that, and he rolled over and he put on the poultice, and God said, I'll give you 15 more years, and uh, we need a sign, and the sun turned back 10 degrees, and uh, you know the Babylonians came, and, and Hezekiah didn't, you know, showed him all his wealth, and the Babylonians said, well, one of these days we'll be back to collect all that wealth. Uh, but after that happened, after that happened, Manasseh was born. So he would not have been born if Hezekiah died. But Manasseh turned out to be the worst, the most wicked king of the, the, ever in the whole line of kings of the southern kingdom, not the northern king we're talking about. Now we're talking about the southern kingdom of Judah. For 50 years he was the worst, offering his children as sacrifices and doing all sorts of awful things. Then he was captured and taken to Babylon as a prisoner. They put hooks in him. They did all kinds of stuff. And he straightened up his ways. And I don't know, we don't have very much detail about this story. Uh, but I'm sorry, not Babylon. He's taken to, to Assyria. Look at verse 11. So the Lord let the commanders of the Syrian army invade Judah. They captured Manasseh, stuck hooks in him, put him in chains, and took him to Babylon. I guess it is Babylon, even though it was Assyrian leaders. In his suffering, he became humble and turned to the Lord his God and begged him for help. God accepted Manasseh's prayer and answered it by letting him go back to Jerusalem and rule again. This convinced Manasseh that the Lord was God. And look at Solomon. You know his story. So here are two cases where clearly rebellious sins, I mean these were out and out open rebellious sins, were apparently, you know, God accepted their, forg their repentance and, and he forgave them. And then I remember 1 John 3, 4. Do you remember what it says in 1 John 3, 4? Our favorite verse for sin, our definition of, of sin? Lawlessness. Okay, whoever sins, my Good News translation says, whoever sins is guilty of breaking God's law because sin is a breaking of law. But a more precise translation would be in the New American Standard Bible, more literal. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness, and another word for lawlessness is rebelliousness. Sin is rebelliousness. So now we've, we've got a challenge here. That kind of sin, the real sins, apparently are not dealt with by this. By the what? By this sin offering we're, we're studying. But they're dealt with somehow by God. So. And, of course, the question I would ask you is how many of your sins are inadvertent or unintentional, and how many are deliberate or intentional, and how many are truly rebellious? What sins? What sins? I know you don't commit any sins, but anyway. I can't. Well, you can get to the point it. where you say what sins, but if you really take what you're talking about, it makes it more complicated, doesn't it? Yeah. And doesn't it, um, couldn't it possibly get back at you somehow and say that, um, you know, you may not be ready for the Lord to come mm -hmm. and maybe never be ready for the Lord to come because it's so complicated, you can't figure it out. Figure it out. Well, 
It tells it a, another section of our lesson, and I don't want to spend a long time on this, the story of Joab and the woman of Tekoa. You remember that David had sons that were battling with each other, and his oldest son basically got his sister to come into his room and buy some trickery and actually raped her. And the king says, well, okay, marry her. And he says, no, I will not marry her. I'm not going to. Anyway, the, sis the brother of the sister who was raped ended up killing the older brother who had raped his sister. Well, David at that point says, you're out of here. And he had to leave the country. Well, Joab, a relative of David's who was commander of the military, thought that this wasn't fair. He, he sort of looked at, with favor on Absalom, who had killed his brother. And so he set this woman up to tell this story to David. And the, the long story, the, the most important part of this story is um, she says, she tells a story about a woman who's a widow and has two sons, and the two sons fight with each other, and one of them, one of them kills the other one. Well, then by law, the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth law, the other son is supposed to be killed. And then she says, if that happens, there will be no one to take care of me. My husband's dead. I have one son left. If he dies, and so David says, go back home. Don't worry. I'll take care of things. And she says, but your majesty, whatever you do, my family and I will take the blame. You and the royal family are innocent. Meaning that it might damage David's reputation as a judge if he did such a thing. And in other words, that's a, in, in, a, in effect, what the lesson is suggesting is that the king would be carrying that sin. He would be res taking responsibility for breaking the law in that case. Uh, and it goes on to say, well, that's what the, what the priest did in this ceremony that's going on in the sanctuary. They carried the sins. Now, I don't know how impressive that argument is to you, but let me ask another question. And I think this is the more important one. The widely accepted theory of forensic atonement, which is believed by many Christians in our day, suggests that justice demands the death of the sinner. That's the legal requirement. In that view, in order to save sinners, God the Father agreed to accept the death of his son and payment of the price of sin and pronounce that justice was satisfied, thus removing the legal barrier so that he could accept sinners back again. So in other words, God says, there's a sin, the price has to be paid, someone has to pay for this, and Jesus says, I'll pay. And so he says, okay, you've agreed to pay, that's, someone's paid, that's what matters. And uh, this removes, removes a kind of legal barrier, and God can accept sinners back again. But we ask this question, wouldn't a human judge be errant if he condemned the innocent in order to free the guilty? Because that's what's happening, isn't it? Well, theoretically, he volunteered. Well, and but no, he's still innocent. Well, it's true, but... He's still uh, innocent. No one can volunteer to take your prison sentence, can they? Well, that's, that's the question here. I think that's ridiculous, but, but somebody might think it, you can do that. Well, there are examples. I, I, can, I can tell you an example of, of a time in, in, in the military where... A young man who had a somewhat quite a bit older brother who had a wife and a family, and this young man was just he just just gotten married and and had a young family, and the older man was you know his his family were mature and grown and out of the home, and the young man did something that was considered worthy of death in the military, and he, was, he slept on duty or whatever, and the older brother said, "Let me die in his place and let him go free," and apparently they. They accepted that. That's a Civil War story, isn't it? I think Could I've be. heard a few of those. Could be, but there's that's. But yeah. anyway, let's yeah. let's go on. Let's think about this. See, we're asking a different question here, a question which I think needs to be asked, because the lesson focuses on how all of this carrying of the placing your heads on the lamb and the sin being borne by the blood and the priest sprinkling the blood here and there. How does that affect you and me? My question is, what does it say about God? So now, and now my question, here it is, the question raised more than a thousand years ago, or almost, I guess almost a thousand years ago, by uh, a, a literary character in Anselm's book, Cure Deus Homo, if God could only save sinners by condemning the innocent, 
In other words, you can't, your sins can't be, give, can't be forgiven unless you kill that lamb. Is he truly omnipotent? I mean, an omnipotent person should be able to do anything, right? If, on the other hand, he could, but is not willing to do so, how are we to think of him as wise and just? What justice could there possibly be in accepting the death of the most innocent man who ever lived in place of the guilty? No human legal system would accept that, so how can God do such a thing? And if this legal transaction makes it possible for God to save sinners because they are covered with the righteousness of Christ, would that suggest that we are taken into heaven without God the Father realizing that we're still sinners? Is that legal fiction? Yeah. If, if we accept the notion of because Adam sinned and therefore sin was imputed to oh. mankind, then I don't see why it's so hard to accept the fact that through one man, everyone becomes righteous. It's either you accept one, you cannot accept one and not accept the other. Yeah. Do we have the choice of God wants versus God shows? Does God want death as payment of sin? Or does God show that death is a result of sin? So do we have a God that wants death? No. Or do we have a God that shows what causes death? Yeah. And we have to decide what God we serve. Yeah. Is that? Big but difference, just, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and, but you see, what you're focusing on again is, and which I think is the more important part, is what does this say about God? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, you think God is happy that all these lambs are being killed? He said, your offerings disgust me. Well, later he said that, yeah. <laughs> That's true. No, it is true. So is, God, he... is God teaching, or is, does God actually want blood? I think he's well, a teaching God. We, we, in an earlier lesson, if you remember, I said the whole point of that lesson is sin leads to death. That's what we're supposed to learn. I think that is the main point of what's going on here. Death is a result of sin. Yeah. But if you, in, no, in those terms, you, if God's a teacher, that means somebody's got to be doing some learning. Mm -hmm. And learning, many times, that it, what you're learning comes through the filter of your past experience, and you've got to wrestle with uh, all that. And that's hard work. Thinking mm -hmm. is hard work. Today is quite hot and humid. Go out and dig a ditch in the hot sun would be easier work than to wrestle with some of the questions we're having to deal with now. Yeah. Well, if you also, if you arrive at death, what have you arrived to that kills you? Mm -hmm. That's the question. That's, that's the question. Is it just justice? I, I think. And whatever? What? Yeah. I think we need to deal with Yoli's question. Are we guilty because of Adam's sin? And my answer to that would be, absolutely not. We're not guilty because of Adam's sin, but we are separated from God because of Adam's sin. We're all diseased. Yeah. All we, 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 we don't have the privilege of living in the Garden of Eden. It's long since gone. We, we, we don't have that privilege. So we are separated from God in a sense, not because of our own fault, but because of what Adam and Eve did. And our so, relationship to them. And our relationship to them. Well, I've made plenty of sins on my own. I didn't need Adam to help me. Well, that's exactly what Romans 5 <laughs> says. It says the reason, we've, the reason we're, we, we should die because of our sins is not because of Adam's sin, but because we participated in all this sinning business. Well, but then the question, the, there's a, a question that is begged about um, um, our potential for sinning because of what's happened to you know, our nature, and uh, which is the result yeah. of his sin, so. And there's another question, which is now because we have suggested that what we're, what we're learning here from the earthly sanctuary is supposed to teach us about the heavenly sanctuary, right? And I read in Zechariah 3, 1 to 5, in another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. There beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. Okay, so now we have all the three parties involved. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. And Joshua is standing there wearing filthy clothes. Okay, what do the filthy clothes represent? And he sins. God's, the sins of the whole people. But he, he was the high priest, right? So this would represent the sins of the people, right? And what does God do? The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Didn't say go and lay your hands on a lamb, the head of a lamb. He just says take them away. 
Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. And so he goes on, gives him new clothes. Is that, is that, uh, is God not following his own rules here? Or what's going on? God can do anything he wants. <laughs> <laughs> but I think sometimes some of those things are for the benefit of the people. Uh -huh. It's just like, a, you know, it's not like now people can go take a pill or go, not everybody's Catholic, they go and say five Hail Marys. But I think sometimes it's for the benefit of the person himself because uh, uh, kind of like what uh, Joanne was saying, I think that uh, some other people felt better after whatever yeah. ritual happened and they figure, okay, they're good again, they can, because sometimes those were terrible sins, those people were real sinners. They were yeah. Evil people. <laughs> Back to Romans 5, mm -hmm. it says we were rec uh, or 5, 10, uh, we're reconciled with Jesus' death. Well, we're, the people were really in a never, never in a state of being what, conciliator, uh, conciliation, uh, but he says we're reconciled by his death, but we are healed, saved by his life. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, his life, well, what's important about his life? You got to study, you got to learn about it, mm -hmm. and that's hard work. But if you got somebody, well, just paid the penalty for you, and, and uh, that's, that's it. It's kind of like winning a lottery. It distorts your perception of reality. Okay, well, we need to get back to our lesson. And our lesson is what's going on with all this, these lambs being killed. So is a, I kind of think that the Joshua, the high priest, and the filthy clothes is one model mm -hmm. for how sin is dealt with. Mm -hmm. The sanctuary service is another model for how sin is dealt with. Neither is actually correct mm -hmm. in absolute manner, but they're illustrations. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the, the challenge is, I will tell you, that those who are very concerned about this sanctuary model will tell you, this is a model of what's happening in heaven. And how do you respond to that? Say it's a model, it's not reality. Okay, well, you then be they careful. Say, they say we have an advocate with the Father. And, and you take, take those few words, that's a string there, and it implies that Jesus is pleading with the Father. No, we, the Father and the Son are both on our side we're trying to win us over to, to understanding. Didn't Jesus say, I don't have to plead to the Father mm -hmm. with you in the Bible? John 16, 26. Yep. John 16, 26. 25 to 27, if you want to read the full... Yeah. Okay, but now the let's problem, the problem is not the model. The problem is our perception, how we, how the the, the misconclusions that we draw about. Okay, well let's try not to do that. Let, let's look at the model. Um, note carefully this following sequence of events. One, the sinner brings his lamb. He lays his hands on the head of the lamb and confesses his sin. And this is the process at the temple. This is the process at the sanctuary. The ancient right. ta tent tabernacle. Okay. I did something wrong. This is what I'm supposed to do. So let me ask you a question. How many other people do you suppose were watching when you did that? How would you like to come and confess your sins in front of the whole crowd? Certainly the next person in line was watching. Yes, for sure. Okay, two. The, animal, the animal's throat is cut and the animal dies. Right there in front of you. And you're watching. Three. The blood is what, what our lesson calls the blood manipulation. The priest catches some of that blood. What does he do? He takes it around and he splatters some of the blood. Well, he puts blood on the, on the corners, the, the horns, sometimes called the horns, of the altar. And then the rest of the blood is poured out at the base of the altar. And then what happens? The, burning, the, the fat is all taken out of the animal and it's burned on the altar, only the fat. And then the animal's flesh is prepared in a certain way, and it doesn't describe how it's prepared. And then it's eaten by the priest. And then the priest carries that sin in, in symbol into the sanctuary where it stays until the Day of Atonement. And it's, it's cooked before the priest eats it, isn't it? Presumably. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've often wondered this. You know, when, when they're told that when they, when they prepare something to eat, you know, they got to cut it and they got to drain all the blood and make sure it's kosher. It, did they go through all those kosher rules here and at this point in, in time? Uh, you know, this reminds me of what Jesus said, this is my body mm -hmm. and this is, this is my blood. And what do we do with it? We drink it and eat it. Mm -hmm. 
So there's there's a similarity there, isn't yes. there? Yes. But it's yeah. not real blood or body. It's bread and and grape juice. Well, it's still well. That's that's kind of the point there. That that you know the symbol has a concept behind it. It works just as well with eating a piece of meat as it does eating a piece of bread. You're still consuming it, and it's becoming you. Yeah. So um, your question about the sanctuary too, being up in heaven, them. Are they sacrificing lambs up there or not? Well, well it's not exactly. It doesn't have to be that way, but it could be still portraying the concept of both of them. You know? and, and the question is, do your sins get forgiven as soon as you confess them on the head of the lamb and you cut his throat? Uh, or, or at that point, when you confess them, do, are they forgiven? Or does, are they forgiven when you cut his throat? Or they only, only forgiven after the blood is spilled out and God smells the pleasing aroma? I mean, you can ask lots of questions about this. And I can tell you, it becomes a lot more complicated because down in the days of Jesus, there was one time about 10 years after Jesus died when someone came and tried to estimate how many people had come to Passover. They estimated 2 million people came. Can you imagine 2 million people trying to sacrifice lambs? It, it indicates a tremendous industry in breeding Animals so, and the hygiene problems, uh, even exactly. by today's standard. It, yeah, imagine the smell. <coughs> oh, you so th what, the, what, what, what this person said is that they got to the place where they said, you can't even bring your lamb unless there are less 10 people, all who come and, uh, and, and confess their sins on the head of one lamb, because we can't possibly deal with that many lambs. So apparently 10 people came, all confessed their sins on at least 10, on the head of one lamb, and then that lamb was sacrificed. But you still look at that, though, and, and the point is still getting across. Mm -hmm. Even Hopefully. with ten people, as opposed to one, it's still getting across. The priest, so, the priest couldn't have eaten that much meat. Yes. There was no cool stores <laughs> to preserve it. I mean, it, the whole concept makes you wonder. Well, but there was a whole tribe of Levi, remember? You know, it's not just one priest. Uh, it's still a lot of meat. Yeah. I, I was attracted to the Seventh-day Adventist Church because of how detailed and how they follow the Bible and study the Bible. But there are some, I, <laughs> guess, I guess you have to go through this to get detail, but sometimes it gets so nitty gritty, it's absolutely comical to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's no other church th that will even touch these kind of topics, yeah. but they are worth uh, yeah. talking out because then you do understand better. But uh, that is a real talent of Seventh-day Adventists to be about as real as you can be. Well, one of the points it wants to emphasize in this lesson is Leviticus 17.11. Look at that. What do you make of this? Leviticus 17.11, the life of every living thing is in the blood, and that is why the Lord has commanded that all blood be poured out on the altar to take away the people's sins. Blood, which is life, takes away sins. Now, I won't ask any of the doctors in the room to uh, describe how life is in the blood because we will tell, the pathologist will tell you the life is definitely not in the blood. Now, the, the blood sustains life because it carries oxygen. But the individual red blood cells, for example, don't even have nuclei anymore. They're gone. And they're, they're, they're basically dead. And they pretty, after a period of time, they just fall apart and they're replaced. So it's not the fact that the blood is li literally living. It's the fact that it represented. I mean, you can imagine in ancient times, if someone was seriously injured or an animal is killed, the blood pours out and then pretty soon the animal or the person is dead. So what do you conclude? Life is in the blood, right? So we understand that. So again, these are important points for us to recognize that this is not, this is not trying, this is not a scientific lesson. This well, is helping us to understand how people in a different culture and different setting thought. Well, this also is how God's t trying to protect. Notice the fat was uh, taken out of the animal before it's eaten, and the blood needs to be taken out. Now, there's two things that cause disease. Yeah. That's when you eat the fat of meat and when you eat meat with the blood in the meat. So was well, this God's protection? Maybe. Well, but she's going back to the science part of it again. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and there's something else of interest. This has nothing to do with this lesson per se, but the flavor and meat is carried by the blood and the fat. So if you remove the blood and the fat and then you boil the meat, it has no flavor whatsoever. 
So is that why God told them to remove the blood and the fat so they wouldn't develop a taste for meat? I have a question. Mm -hmm. If the if scripture is a lot of people even say it's God's finger of yeah. and what have you. If that is true, then if God created something so he would know how it's supposed to work, does that show God's inability or people's limitation? Because the, they didn't understand basic things. Mm -hmm. So how come when God dictated the Bible to them, he failed to explain a few things to them? Yeah. Well, here, here's, well, here's it's, be, it's because, well, these people Life was at, at Moses' time were uh -huh. slaves. They'd uh -huh. been, mm -hmm. they were, they had no free will before that. Mm -hmm. This is starting almost from scratch. And the poor people in those days were much, were, they were much more than cavemen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's the way it's brought. interesting, if you read yeah. through carefully Leviticus 4, which is this basically the basis for this lesson, it will say if you're really poor, you can bring fine flour. Mm -hmm. You don't have to bring a lamb mm -hmm. as an offering, and it still gets rid of your sin. So we don't need blood. We don't need blood. Flour, you mean as in baking flour? As in baking flour. And what do they do, sprinkle it on the altar? Yeah. Well, now let me read this. Yeah. Let me read you. This is, this is what the lesson wants us to conclude. Now, this is, this is the section for Monday. I'm reading from the Bible study guide. The next time you are tempted to sin, envision Jesus dying on the cross and see yourself putting your hands on his head and confessing your sins over him. How might this concept played out in your mind help you to understand just what it cost in order to be forgiven? How could this idea help you to resist succumbing to that next temptation. Well, how come you have to do that to <laughs> do what's right? Yeah. I mean, why do you have to think about Jesus on the cross just to do what's right? I mean, can't you do things right because it's right? Well, <laughs> well, to me, that makes me want to say I'm too sinful and I can't even approach Jesus and I just better go away completely. Mm -hmm. And where if you look at God has Jesus up there as a mark of love and he's drawing you towards him, you are more um, tend to want to go to the cross. To me, that, that would make me want to say, um, I can't put my hand on him again. I've done too much. You know, I just have to go mm -hmm. away completely. So I don't know. It, that wouldn't work over the years. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I understand. Now, there's another complication. It's found in Luke uh, and Leviticus 6, verse 27. And I read, Anyone or anything that touches the flesh of the animal will be harmed by the power of its holiness. If any article of clothing is spattered with the animal's blood, it must be washed in a holy place. Now, I don't know how many of you have had this experience of, of dealing with a person who's been cut or dealing with an animal that you have to sacrifice in some way or another, but it's very easy to splatter blood around. So how many of these people, having maybe for the first time coming up there and cutting the, the throat of a lamb, splattered blood on their clothes? Does that mean, because these people are not allowed to go into a holy place to clean their clothing, does that mean who's going to do that? Sounds like it sounds like an attempt to make things more civilized. Maybe. Maybe they want people to gently slash versus slash slash. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken, I, I didn't think that the that the uh, the penitent here uh, went into the uh, into the holy place. I thought no, they 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 just go to the entrance. That's right, and it was the priest that carried. Uh, f uh, Fine, but on. it says if you're if you're slaying this animal. And now this animal becomes a holy sacrifice. What if some of that blood splashes on your clothes? What does it say you're supposed to do? The, the clothes are supposed to be taken and washed in a holy place. Is that the holy place in the sanctuary, or is that a... A holy place. Yeah. Presumably, it would have to be somewhere within the somewhere sanctuary. That's in, 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 the, in, in the outer court, probably. But I don't remember where, but one place you said the person who, who takes the animal away yeah. or whatever has to go wash before they can come back and enter yeah, again. Exactly. So where, it's confusing. 
They had okay. to have washrooms around that whole place. Okay, so <laughs> now let's 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 be clear. What is what in symbol is happening? You come, you confess your sins over the head of this lamb, the blood is picked up, and the fat and the lamb are, are either or basically burned, except for a part which may be eaten by the priest. But what's what's where do your sins go? They are carried by the by the blood, right? Symbolically. Symbolically, they're carried by the blood. So that blood goes where? Into the holy place. Well, uh, sooner or later, it ends up, it's, uh, ends up in the holy place. And if it's a if it's a priest or a or the whole congregation is committed to sin, that blood is spilled on the on the on the on the uh, right in front of the altar of incense, just before the most holy place. And and also, of course, that's in the holy place. So. The whole process here is moving sins from the congregation to the sanctuary, right? If the blood gets sprinkled in front of the incense, isn't the incense the prayers of the people that are saying, forgive me? Mm -hmm. well, so is that where you should bring your prayers, I mean your sins, to your prayer that says, forgive me? Is that a... So how, where does this concept come from where you move your sins around? Well, that's one of the next questions. I mean, can you move, can you make an animal guilty for your sins? Well, you know, as they're doing their things, going through their ritual, and they put their hands over the the lamb, um, doesn't that kind of transfer meaning more than the sin? Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we're not really talking about something. Well, how can you talk about sins actually being physical anyway when they're done and passed? Yeah. Except for the effects, it they're still there. It's a, no matter what you do at the sanctuary, it doesn't undo the sin. Well, the, it's my understanding that there there isn't any movement of, of sins between you and the animal. This is a this is a this is your school you were talking about. This is a this is a, a learning. This is the this is the way the people are learning many things about sin, but that, that, um, um, that something is coming to do this. The lamb isn't, isn't doing this. Okay. 3,000 years later, we still haven't learned what this is supposed to mean. Well, so know, how are they supposed to learn it? There's something happening different today. We're talking about sin. Mm -hmm. In today's world, I do not hear about people saying they're sinful. I hear people, I mean, it seems like sin is a disappearing thing. Yes. That what you're doing is something that you want to do and you get to decide what is good and what is bad. And also the government is deciding what is good and what is bad in contrast to what the Bible says is yeah. what is good and what is bad. So we're talking about sin I don't think I have heard people talk about sin or that they've when been sinners. When was the last time you heard anybody mention sin on a national, radio, a national television program? No. Well, sin is disappearing. I've heard about food. <laughs> <laughs> about Indulging sinful in food? sinful food, yeah, and that was about Well, <laughs> Ken, Ken th th this, this tent was an, an elaborate ritual process. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was the message was that something's going to take care of, care, come along and, and deal with this sin problem. Mm -hmm. I'll phrase it that yeah. way. And we we have a ritual today that's in place of this. Okay. It deals with blood, and it deals with the body. Um, in our church, we do this quarterly, mm -hmm. but the communion service today, mm -hmm. it would be my perception, is. Is is it's a, it's a highly modified and far more simple ritual, but the purpose of it is the same as the purpose of the sanctuary. And if I'm incorrect here, why well, cor yeah. correct me? But whereas before the sanctuary looked forward, our communion service, um, well, I'm going to say looks backward. Although I'm not quite back, but it, I'm not quite sure it's it's mm -hmm. it's quite that finalized. But Am I, am I correct in this kind of an understanding right. of, of uh, how the, these rituals relate together? There's, there's always been something from the time that, that, 
that Adam had to deal with the thing right there, right out after they came out of the Garden of Eden. There has been some kind of a of a ritual, and I don't understand really the purpose of rituals so much, but I just recognize it's there. Mm -hmm. It's some okay. kind of a thing that we do. Well, let's let's look at this. One of the most famous and and most maybe most impressive texts about God and his what he does for us is found in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And this is God speaking directly to his friend Moses. And I'm reading, the Lord then passed in front of him. Remember, he's, he's put Moses in the cleft of the rock there on top of the mountain and called out, I, the Lord, am a God who is full of compassion and pity, who is not easily angered and who shows great love and faithfulness. I keep my promise for thousands of generations and forgive evil and sin. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the original language here, this forgive evil and sin, it says literally, carries the evil. But I will not fail to punish children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation for the sins of their parents. And if we go back to some of the verses we've been talking about, for example, Leviticus 10, 17 says, why didn't, it, you know, this is a time when Aaron and his sons are just learning how to go through all these rituals correctly, and one time they burned the meat instead of eating a portion of it so they could, quote, carry the sin into the sanctuary, and Moses was very upset with them. He says, how could you burn this? In verse 18, since his blood was not brought into the sanctuary at sacred tent, you should have eaten the sacrifice there as I commanded. In other words, they didn't carry the sin. Now, is it possible, really, to carry sins around? That's the question. Ellen White comments about this in a, a, an unusual place. It's found in a manuscript, releases volume 9, page 302, which is not available unless you have the, the CD-ROM, I think. But it says, the blessing comes because of pardon. Pardon comes through faith that the sin confessed and repented of is borne by the great sin-bearer. Okay? The pardon comes through faith. Thus from Christ cometh all our blessings. His death is an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He is a great medium through whom we receive the mercy and favor of God. He then is indeed the originator, the author, as well as the finisher of our faith. Manuscript releases volume 9, page 302. So, since pardon comes through faith, which can mean believing, which can mean trusting, that the sin is borne by the great sin bearer, what would happen if you weren't sure? Does that mean that sin would not be born? Well, that would mean that you would think that you still had your sin. Well, what this implies is now that faith takes the place of the animal sacrifice in our day. They that didn't would, have faith back then? I mean, I'm, I'm just... I'm just they, saying, uh, they had faith that the animal did it, and now he's, God is training yeah. us to have faith. And, and let, let's be honest. They had come out of a very, I mean, these were slaves, ex-slaves. And they, they thought only in very concrete ways. They needed to see it in front of their eyes to believe. This is why they demanded the golden calf. We want to see, we don't want a God who, who's yeah. up there in the clouds and, and scares us to death. We want something we can see and that we can hang on to and we can manipulate ourselves, which of course was wrong. But that's what they wanted. They wanted a, a God that they could move around the way they wanted to. I mean, and that, look what happened to the sons of Eli many years later. They wanted to take the ark out of the tabernacle and move it around. They wanted to say, okay, God, we're going to take your ark down here to this battle, and therefore you have to help us win because we've taken the And what happened to the ark? Got taken by the Philistines down to the temple of Dagon. Of course, uh, something happened to Dagon and sort of, <laughs> you know, that was the idea in ancient times, you know. If you conquered a nation, the first, and, and you really got to their capital city and you actually conquered the capital city, the first thing you would try to do is get into the temple, grab their idol, whatever it was, and take that idol back and put it in your temple and say, okay, now this idol is a servant to your God. So, um, the, the battle of might and power. The battle of might and power. So what have we learned? We've only got a few minutes left. What we have here in the sanctuary is a very concrete way of presenting the idea 
that a person's sins could be taken away, they could be carried by some semi-mysterious means that maybe they didn't fully understand, carried by the blood eventually into the tabernacle, and there at the sanctuary they would stay until the end of the year, and at the end of the year, on the Day of Atonement, which we'll talk about next time, we'll find out what happens to the sins after that. Now, how do you feel about that whole idea? The whole idea of what? That sins can be stored up and piled up inside of the sanctuary. Well, it's very physical, that's for sure. Very concrete. Well, here we're sitting with multiple college degrees mm -hmm. talking about what was used to train cavemen. Mm -hmm. and slaves. Mm -hmm. I mean, so do we even have a concept of, uh, we can vaguely just... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that happens as long as they're, that, they're, that my sins are taken and put someplace else. I don't care where they are. Okay. Well, it's interesting to notice God's comments a number of years later in Micah 6, 6 to 8 in, as a conclusion. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn his offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? Now, I mean, I mean, you know, this is going all out, right? Shall I offer my firstborn child to pay for my sins? And boy, they thought that was the ultimate sacrifice. No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, that's the righteous thing, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Now, to us, that, that makes a lot more sense. Why didn't he say that at the foot of Mount Sinai? They wouldn't have gotten it. Yeah. So, in conclusion, what's happening in the heavenly sanctuary? Is this a picture, a perfect picture? Well, there's several things we know are not true. We know they're not killing lambs up there. Now, we believe that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. How is that actually portrayed? Do we need an altar burnt offering up there? Because there won't be any burnt offerings, right? Do we need a labor? Does anybody get dirty up there? Um, you know, do we need a most holy place? God is going to be everywhere. He's going to be walking around with us. Why do we need a most... So there's things that we don't understand about this whole thing, but it was a symbolic way of saying your sins can be separated from you and taken away. See you next week.